स्टार्ट कीजिए नंबर से स्टार्ट ही Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one true God. Amen. Good evening, friends. We shall begin with the praise of our uh, Lord Felix Enos. Let's pray. Lord of all, by your great mercies, make us servants worthy. to be preserved to the injustice without the scars of sin blessed are you o god of our fathers and your holy name is magnified and glorified forever amen lord may your grace and mercy be upon us for our trust is in you Blessed are you, O Lord, teach and show us the way of your commandments. Blessed are you, by your grace, make us to understand the way of your laws. Blessed are you, Holy One, enlighten us with your luminous rays. Lord, may your mercy be upon us. Do not neglect or leave the work of your hands. Glory befits you, honor befits you, and praise befits you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Good evening, friends. I shall share my screen. All right. Thank you so much for your patience, dear friends. Welcome to yet another session of uh, of the study on more on Philosophy of Marburg. I was told by Abu Nadeeroyo Gabriel to take this class on his behalf, as he has some other engagements to cater to. i will be taking the final two classes of the series namely the classes would be on faith and simplicity today we will be focusing on the memoir on faith by philip sinos of marburg now he has two memoirs on faith so dear friends for any study to happen there should be a basic hypothesis and we cannot question the hypothesis because if we were to do so then 
that study wouldn't stand. You can derive questions from the hypothesis that you are making, but you can't question the hypothesis itself. Otherwise, uh, the structure would break. Questioning the hypothesis would lead to, uh, as philosophers would say, it would lead to infinite regression, ending up nowhere. So when Philoxenus of Marburg writes on faith, he takes uh, the epistle of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 6, as his hypothesis. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. To study about God, faith becomes our hypothesis, the first principle, as one would call it. So when we begin to study about God, we should prima facie believe that he exists. And this happens through the faculty of faith. And this becomes our hypothesis. In Tuesday morning, there is a hymn, there's a kukulio. We sing in the kukulio. Deva tel pratya shayode chayuganan mahaleluya. Uriel marvi tiriugani vishmasam. Put your hopes in God and do good. Dwell on the earth and seek faith. There's also a reference to this in Thursday morning prayer. You are an instance of propitiation, prophets, apostles, and holy martyrs. For upon you, the church is built in faith. The church is built in faith, or the church is built on faith. Be intercessors for our children who have taken refuge where your bones are placed. We also have a hymn from Friday evening that says, You are physicians, chosen apostles, and disciples of the great physician, and the one who approaches your bone in faith receives help from you. Again, the first principle becomes, the, becomes faith. Through faith, we approach the bones of the saints. And only if we approach through faith uh, would we gain any benefit from that. Also, in the order of St. James, St. James Taksa, the prayer before first diptych, first Tubdin, it says, Holy Church is founded on the rock of faith and is invincible to the gates of Sheol. Deliver her from the offenses of heresy to the very end. So you see, all these references point to the basic fact that faith becomes our first principle with, on which we study about God or make deliberations about Him. And that is why the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 24 records the most natural and most human as well as most agonizing prayer of faith, which becomes the foundation prayer of faith. And this was uh, put forward by the father of the boy possessed with an unclean spirit. We can see it. We can see the reference in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. That's where we find this prayer. It says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Because, as I said, faith should be our first principle. And that is what the first principle of Philoxenos is also about. What I've done is I've taken some quotations from this member, and together we'll read the quotations and then unravel the meaning embedded in the quotation. Member on faith 2.1. Believing God and not investigating God. Faith affirms God's words, but does not investigate regarding his nature. 
Now we cannot investigate uh, the nature of God. That would be in vain because God belongs to the uncreated category. And all of us, we belong to the created category or the created realm. We are using instruments from the created realm to talk about something of the uncreated realm, God. And therefore, all our attempt to describe or define God is in some way a distortion. Because human language, which is a created category, has its own limitation to speak about something which is uncreated. Now, for instance, to point out the limitations of human linguistics, if I were to tell you to describe to me the aroma of a coffee, nobody can do that. So human language is very finite, it's very limited. And because uh, we belong to the created category and we use created categorical uh, instruments to speak about something uncreated, obviously our definitions and descriptions would be uh, close to distortions. That is why orthodox theology below, uh, believes or propagates apophatic theology, which means trying to, trying to understand God in the categories of uh, negative attributes. Like when we say God is love, it's not, it's not about saying what God is. It's about finding out what God is not. You know? And Dionysius, the Ariopagat, writes well about apophaticism trying to define God on the, on the ground of what he is not. The same concept is shared in Indian philosophy uh, where God is tried to be understood in terms of the same apophaticism and they employ the terms needy, needy, which means not this and not that. The first uh, thing what first quotation Felix Sinner says, don't investigate the nature of God, because that's that's weird, because he belongs to the uncreated realm, and we belong to the created realm. So there's no point in investigating the nature of God. Believe rather than investigating. How is it possible for a created human being to judge the will of his maker? See, it is not possible for the created beings to uh, to completely know or, or to, uh, to investigate or to judge uh, him who was uncreated. Third creation, anyone who draws near to God should acquire the mind of a child. The womb that causes us to be born again is placed in the middle, which is baptism, into which the spirit is mixed so we are being born by faith. Now, this is a tradition which says the womb that causes us to be born again is placed in the middle. Now, this is referring to the baptismal font. Because Felixino says that it is placed in the middle, we may assume that in the earlier church, it might have been possible that the baptismal font was in the middle which is still practiced in some reformed churches, I believe. Uh, for example, in Anglican churches, I guess, the Baptist reform still continues to be in the middle. Because people enter through, uh, through the portico. So the first thing they should see is the baptismal font. Because baptismal font, or baptism is where uh, uh, it's completed. Now, Christ, who was spiritually born from his father, had to 
physically take birth from Mary to become fully human and fully divine. In our case, the process is reversed. We are physically born first, and then we take birth spiritually from the waters of baptism. And that is why when the priest mixes uh, the hot water and cold water in the baptismal font, he prays, let this water become a spiritual womb. Moreover, if one observes the, the construction of baptismal font, is like, uh, it's like a womb. It resembles a womb. And Syriac theology identifies church as Mary, as Mary, the mother of God. So you, we enter Mary, we take birth from her womb, which uh, is represented by the baptismal font. And then our birth becomes complete. And that is why many of our saints celebrated their baptismal day as their birthdays. Because it's not important when you come into this world, but it is most certainly important when we are born in Christ. So we go to the next quotation. And it's a, he says that, which is so, uh, we are being born by faith. So faith, a baptismal font, it becomes our spiritual mother. We are children with regard to that knowledge and infants with respect to the ineffable wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is ineffable. At the same time, it is at odds with the wisdom of the world. There are two ways of viewing reality. One is through the earthly register, and the other one is through the heavenly register. Now, from the earthly register, uh, the crucifixion of Christ would appear as an ignominious death. But from the heavenly register, it's what the coronation of Christ looks like. Or it's what love looks like from the heavenly register. And Christianity begins by shattering the wisdom of the world. When the so-called wise men were drawn to the palace of Herod, reprimanding the star they saw at the rising, and they assumed that, okay, now this star signifies the birth of a king, and a king in all probability should be born in a palace, they sent forth to the palace of Herod. That was the result of worldly wisdom. But the star never led them to uh, the palace. It was their own parochial, imperial wisdom which led them to the palace. Because after the, once they reached the palace, they were astonished to see the star going before them. So the wisdom of God draws the worldly wisdom to a manger, to a cradle. And that is what Isaiah prophecy way before Christ. He said that Christ is going, or Christ said to Isaiah that I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. 2.3 quotation. If he should see a snake or a scorpion, he is not reluctant to stretch out his hand to touch them in his innocence and ask his father or his mother to give them to him, making known his childish desire through his crying. Now, Philoxenos here speaks about the quality of our prayer, the quality of our requests. Seldom we know what to ask. And sometimes our needs are so childish and very dangerous to us because we ask in ignorance. But we should mature in Christ who happens to be the wisdom of God. Colossians, in the epistle of Colossians, it says Christ is the wisdom of God. 
So the more we grow into freedom, the less liberty we have because our ignorance is being shattered. Now, for instance, uh, I have the freedom to burn my hand or to keep my hand over the flame. But what is preventing me to do so is the knowledge that if I do so, my arm would be burnt. So it's the knowledge or the wisdom that I have is preventing my freedom. So the more matured we become in wisdom, the lesser liberty we have. And then we would ask for the right things because asking the wrong things in prayer is kind of dishonoring our Father in heaven. This same emotion is shared by St. Isaac of Nineveh, where he writes in his homilies that when you ask something childish before God, it is dishonoring the master himself. So we should be very careful as to what we ask. And our requests are mediated by scriptural wisdom. It is in and through the scriptures we, and of course, the holy sacraments, that we mature in Christ, and then we know the right things to ask. 2.5. God is not, he is not a person, but a self-existent nature which is believed and acknowledged in three persons. Now, God is, we believe in a triune God, right? One nature, three hypostasis. But at the same time, we have only one God who is the Father. That is how our creed begins. We believe in one God, the Father. One God, the Father. The God is always the Father. Now, Christ, specifically speaking, he is Son of God. Because that Son of God is his hypostatic quality. Then the Spirit becomes the Spirit of the Father. Yes, in essence, all three of them are God. But when we speak, try to be as specific as possible. Not because calling Jesus Christ God is not right. It's absolutely right. But be specific to his hypostatic nature. So call him Son of God. We believe in one God the Father. We believe in Christ, the Son of God. And we believe in spirit who proceeds from the Father through the Son. Two point seven. Okay, uh, and he is a now. Now, when we think about contemplate on Trinity, the relationship becomes a very important aspect to meditate on. Unlike the reformers, we do not end the prayer in the name of Christ, Amen. We begin and end our prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a relationship. In fact, we don't know God beyond relationship. All we have is a bunch of relationship terms.
Sorry, it got disconnected. Uh, hang on. I'm not able to share my screen. It says only the host can share in this. Okay. Thank you. Please try. Please. Can you see my screen? No, nothing. No, sorry. Okay. Okay. How about now? Yeah, can see. Okay. 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 Uh, Two point nine. He gave five senses to a human being so that one might experience. Now the Sarif would use well, the literal translation would be taste. One might taste the world in a multitude of different ways. Then beyond these five senses of which. I have spoken, no one is able to experience anything from the physical world, for even the world itself does not exist beyond these things. So, well, one of the uh, attributes of having faith is to acknowledge the finitude and the limit of uh, human rational faculties, as well as the human senses. Now, we only have five senses. Our knowledge is restricted to these five senses. It's like uh, seeing the seven colors of a spectrum. Now, we can only see seven colors, but that doesn't mean you know it's only seven. There could be more. But all our knowledge is restricted within the boundaries of uh, these five senses. So to have faith is to look forward to something beyond our nature. Because human beings are at the same, uh, are, are celestial and terrestrial at the same time. This is what happens in the church. When we go to the church and begin the Kaumo, holy, 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 this is actually the hymn of the angels. Now because we hold two worlds in us, the physical world and the spiritual world, are we able to sing the hymn of the angels? Two point ten. Even though faith is planted in us by God, our Creator, that is into our constitution, it was corrupted and transformed from faith to error. Philoxeno says that the order of faith has been disturbed. We have applied faith to things which shouldn't be believed. And when you do that, uh, faith becomes error, like transferring your faith to idols or to substances which is very physical in nature. When you do that, 
you're actually disturbing the order of faith. You're actually defeating the purpose of faith. And on that, that and Felix you know, says that cannot be even termed as faith. It should be termed as error. Because faith should always help us uh, to look forward to something which is beyond our nature. Because we know that human beings are destined to become gods. The second epistle of Peter, it says that we are called to be partakers of divine nature. So we, we are not called to become angels or something or, or, or any other celestial being, but we are called to become God himself. And that is why Christ incarnated. That is the basic premise of orthodox spirituality and theology that God became human so that human could become God. So this is what faith should impel us to do. It should impel us to look forward, to, to, to look beyond our human nature because we are called to be not only fully human, but fully divine in Christ. 2.11, by faith, signs occur and miracles are performed and mighty acts are accomplished and wonders are performed. Faith alone affects everything that is above nature. You see, uh, last Sunday, the Evangelion, the Gospel reading of last Sunday says that Christ couldn't perform any miracles in his own hometown because of the unbelief of people. And that is very essential because miracles happen only if we believe. And see the next quotation, the power of God is the power of faith. So we can experience the power of God or God can manifest his power only if we have faith. It's only then would we recognize uh, the power of God. Or more importantly, it is only then would God be compelled to use his power. So the power of God is the power of our faith. Such a strong point. And this all happens because we have a very great creaturely liberty, which is known as free will. You know, we have the liberty to, uh, to hate God, to stop loving God. And God can, or God chooses to wait outside, knocking the door. This is what we read in Revelations. God is waiting outside, knocking the door. Now he, the creator, is becoming a beggar. You see the humiliation of the creator is so great. That creating us, knowing that his own creation would kill him, is, is, uh, is, is, that, that's humility beyond leaps and bounds. But no rational being in his or her proper sense would reject God. We can only reject the love of God out of ignorance. But the more we gain wisdom, the more we would love God. Because all our longing uh, culminates in God, because after all, we are created in the image and likeness of God. So whether we realize it or not, we are always under the magnetic influence of the cross. And that is what Christ promised. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. 2.22, through faith, virtues that are discovered are retained and those that do not exist are acquired. Faith is the gatherer and guardian of precious. That's a good way to put it. Faith is the gatherer and guardian of precious. Now we should realize that uh, Philoxenos is speaking to monks. So not everything would apply uh, to all, but he's very particular because his discourse is are particularly focused on monks. But when you speak about monks, see monks, they, uh, they typify, they, they, 
they put forth a lifestyle, an angelic lifestyle, which says that human beings are created for far greater things than uh, wealth, sex, and self-centeredness. The three vows that a monk usually takes. It's, it's, it's an anti-capitalistic lifestyle if you were to put it in uh, worldly uh, words. Because when the, when, when the world impels us to consume more, monks are the ones who uh, should exhibit the courage and say, and say that, no, I am enough or it is enough. So you're actually putting for the lifestyle uh, showing for the greater potential, uh, the greater potentiality of a human being is capable of. And that is why Philoxeno says, it is through faith that we gain our virtues and not only gain, but preserve those treasures. Three point two. For without faith, everything is ordinary. And when faith has come, these things appear glorious. The mysteries are ordinary, and the spiritual miracles are based if there is no eye of faith that sees them. And you see, God is is actually glorifying the very ordinary circumstances. He's always glorifying the ordinary people. Now he incarnated as a working class man. He took a name as Jesus, which is not a unique name. Uh, during his time, more than 40 or 50 percent of the population was named Jesus. It's a very uh, common name, Jesus. He's, uh, he chose a very poor woman to take birth from, who could only afford to present two turtle doves when he was presented to the church. If we look at the genealogy of Christ, we see there not people who we consider paragon of virtues or paragon of faith, but we find people who were discarded by the society. The very ordinary people, they become the pivotal points in the salvation uh, history. And that is how Christ glorifies the ordinary people and ordinary circumstances. So in order to see the extraordinary in the ordinary, we need faith. In the Holy Horobo, if there is no faith, we, we would only see bread and wine. But through the eyes of faith, we see the body and blood of Christ. Faith is more interior than knowledge, next quotation. Faith is more interior than knowledge. For whatever knowledge does not see is shown to faith, which is more interior. Now, if you read uh, the oration by St. Gregory of Nazia, he says that faith fulfills reason. But what does the worldly wisdom say to us? It says that reason fulfills faith. But it's the other way around. It's faith which actually fulfills our reason. And this is something very unique to us as rational human beings. The next quotation says, the portion that is in us alone, the most glorious of every human being is able to perceive faith. So the ability to be faithful, the ability to perceive faith is embedded only in human beings, not in other creatures. Because why? Because we are created in the image and likeness of God, who is the wisdom himself. Three point three. Next quotation. Even if you see the dead who are being raised up, or the blind whose eyes are being opened, or the demons who are departing, you have not yet seen the full power of faith. 
And this might be what St. Paul says, you know, what our hearts cannot conceive, what our eyes cannot. So what we can not imagine using our five senses, it is that with what God has prepared for us. See, if, I, if you look at St. Paul, he was trained under Gamaliel, who was the greatest biblical the scriptural scholar of his time. Yet, and he knew the scriptures in and out, backwards and forwards, but he could never uh, understand who the scripture was speaking about. But it's only when he, he had this encounter with Christ did he understand what exactly the scripture was. So see, it's not about how much knowledge you have. It's about our encounter with Christ. Our journey, our willingness to journey with him. Our willingness to follow in his footsteps. Now that is what makes those three men wise indeed. Because they showed the courage to leave their country and travel in search of wisdom. There were many scribes in, Beth, in, uh, in Bethlehem itself who knew uh, astronomy and who, who, who knew these stars, the position and, and what the stars, or what a particular star implied. But nobody bothered to leave their comfort zone and go and seek wisdom. Because those three men did so, they can be rightly called wise. So, Faith always necessi necessitates a journey because we believe in a God who likes to travel, not a God who likes to dwell in mansions or establishments. God is always a sojourning God. Right from, you know, it's Bible is a story of multiple exodus. God is always traveling. John chapter 1 verse 40 when God says, uh, and he dwelt among us. The word used there is kano, which means uh, pitching tent. The one, one peculiarity of tent is that it is mobile. It, is, uh, it can be moved. So our God is a traveling God. He is, it's a, he's a sojourning God. And so faith becomes a journey with Christ. That is why uh, the imperative of Christ is follow me. Come join me in this journey. And to show that we are in this faith journey, we participate in the worship standing. We don't sit like other churches, but the Orthodox worship, we stand and worship to show that we are on a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage to paradise, that we are on a faith journey. Yes, occasionally we do sit, that is to rest. Because, of course, in the journey, you take rest. But again, we get up and continue our journey. That is why we stand and worship. Next quotation, faith possesses the power of God. Faith has the will and authority of God and gathers prophets from where it wishes. Faith approaches the bones of the saints. And instead of dead bones, it sees them alive and speaks with them as with the living and asks them concerning its own needs. So nobody dies in Christ because after the death of Christ, death has become a womb for us to enter into life. In the Kaumu, we pray, holy are thou immortal, but in the very next line, we pray, holy, uh, crucified for us, have mercy upon us. Now, that's an irony. First, you affirm him as immortal, and then we say that he was crucified. Now, the Son of God chose to enter into his immortality through his mortality. So that we can dignify our mortality. So because of the death of Christ, and because of his resurrection, we enter into life through death. And this is what is foreshadowed in the sacrament of baptism. The sacrament of baptism is the sacramental anticipation of our death. 
to simply put it the priest takes the child he kills it by drowning it in the water and then brings it back to life so the sacrament of baptism is showing us how well we can die or how to make our death noble because that's that's what we can do in this life because whatever we are going to do we are going to die so the only question is how to die with dignity cross the sacraments they all give us a noble way to end our life uh, a, a dignified a noble way to dignify our you know mortality next quotation faith looks at what is above nature we have already discussed this faith is in the middle between these things that are passed away and those that are to come there is always this tension in the church it is known as the already and the not yet and we are in the middle uh, as paradoxical it might sound in the church we always remember the future it's very uh, you know it's it's funny when we when we say it but yes we remember the future we know what the future is going to look like and because we know what the future is going to look like that everybody is going to as it says in the uh, epistle of timothy everybody would come to the knowledge of christ you know uh, it is uh, we get inspiration from the future and we are being drawn to that future Hebrew eleven three by faith we understand that the worlds were established by the word of God and by those things that are invisible these which are visible came to be. You know, in the in the fourth century, when Saint Athanasius was writing his book on the incarnation, there were many theories which were propagated, saying that God is not the creator, or God created. Uh, out of pre-existing matter. Now, Athanasius argued that no. Now, the Epicureans uh, they said that everybody, uh, everything came into existence just like that. But Athanasius said no. The very diversity and distinctiveness of everything that we see in the world, uh, logically, uh, tells us that. there should be a creator plato said that god created everything out of matter which was pre existing athanasius argued that if god created everything out of matter which was already existing then god cannot be called a creator in the pure sense he just becomes a craftsman god created matter itself and that is why christians believe creation is out of nothing creation ex nihilo creation out of nothing so that's what felixin has also said by faith those things that are visible these things which are visible came to be 3.4 if a human being does not possess faith he is able to treat all these things inscribed in the holy scriptures as false and to say concerning all these secret things that truly exist that they do not exist it is basically our faith that gives existence to all these things one fine example is adam naming the creatures it's like before adam naming the animals they didn't have any existence you know the the the, the literature is framed in such a way that we get the uh, get get the idea that only after adam named the animals did they come into existence so similarly uh, everything the existence of everything is hinged upon our faith if there is no faith then we would discuss or uh, we would dismiss holy scriptures as myths and fables but this is not how a spiritual literature is to be read or how a sacred literature is to be read you can we cannot read 
scriptures in the same way as we would a fiction or a novel or any other historical document. There's a completely different way of reading uh, spiritual texts or scriptures for that matter. We read scriptures not through our physical eyes, but, but through the eyes of faith, which the Holy Fathers call the eyes of the dove. Three point five. Faith does not need miracles. For how does it have need of that thing which is which it made itself? Powers, signs, miracles, and everything such as these take place by faith. Then how would faith stand in need of what it makes? And he says that faith is what gives uh, emergence to all these miracles, powers, and signs. So miracles, powers, and signs they don't define faith. Rather, faith uh, makes these things happen. And because uh, the, the people of Nazareth didn't have faith, Christ couldn't perform anything. Now Christ is a physician, or uh, he, he, is a phys he, he never does anything without our consent. You remember when once Christ asked, uh, asked a sick man whether you, you wanted to be healed? It's only after Christ, that person said, yes, I want to be healed, that Christ healed him. So he respects the liberty of his creatures. And that is why if we don't have faith, God can't do anything even though if he wants to do. Faith is the soil that receives the seed of word of God, just as the seed of the sower is deprived of harvest if he has no faith. So the word of God is void of spiritual profits with us if there is no earth of faith that receives it. You know, it's human body is all clay, it's all dust. All the sufferings, all the hardships that we face on this earth, is in fact making this clay pliable, it's making this clay malleable, so that ultimately we don't lose the imprints of our creator. Our soil, our body, human body is being worked upon so that it finally can reflect the likeness of God. Because right now what we have is just the image. Likeness is yet to be achieved. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 or 27, I, I think God says, let us make human beings an image and likeness. But the, but the very next verse, he says, uh, the scripture says, God made them in his image. Likeness is yet to be achieved. So likeness is achieved through our own ascetic endeavors, through our own hardships. For by the name of God, we shall be called. Uh, the rest of the quotations is more or less the same thing that we have discussed already. Yeah, so you can read all these quotations and just let me know if you have any questions. I'll put my email uh, in the WhatsApp. Just feel free to write to me. And take time to meditate on each of these quotations. You, know. um, you don't need to uh, know the meanings of every, uh, of every quotation, but let it open up more questions. And it's, theology is all about asking the right questions. It's not about knowing the answers. It's about asking the right questions and then discovering uh, the beauty of the journey. Because uh, it's 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 all it's a, it's a matter of lifestyle. It's not it's not it's uh, it's not agnosticism that one can be saved by knowledge. No, Christianity is a matter of lifestyle, and that is why uh, in Acts chapter two uh, it says the early Christians called themselves the way. So God is inviting us on a journey. None of our wisdom can save us. 
how 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 much ever knowledge we accumulate nothing nothing is going to save us knowledge is not going to save us but uh, the true knowledge which is concealed in the sufferings of the cross that is what is going to save us so read through this quotations meditate on the quotations and uh, let me know if you have any doubts we we shall wind up with a word of prayer may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god and the fellowship and the indwelling of the holy spirit be with all of us now and unto ages of ages amen